Welcome back to Booked Up. This is Jen Taub, and today I'm speaking with my friend, Linda Charnas, who happens to be a professor of English, European Studies, and Gender Studies at Indiana University at Bloomington. We covered a lot of ground. We talked about Hamlet, Pollyonic Law, and America's Revenge Fantasies. We also talked about the hallmarks of Gothic literature, including the attempt to evade a past that refuses to remain silent. The focus of our conversation is Hamlet's Heirs, Shakespeare and the Politics of a New Millennium, a collection of essays that she wrote 20 years ago, but still remain relevant. Let's dive right in. Hey, good to see you. How are you? I'm good. It's weird seeing you in the daytime. (laughs) Yeah. Well, except for the class you took from me. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that so soon. It's been, it's... Yeah, yeah, you make it sound like I'm a vampire. <laughs> I mean, like yeah. there's nothing wrong with that, though. No, I mean, if you were there's... a vampire, would you drink blood or what would be your drink of choice? Mm. Mm. That's a tough one. You know, given that I have these, uh, given that I have these, uh, these snaggle teeth fangs any way. Um, what would I drink if I were a vampire? I'm going to have to get back to you on that uh, okay, because it would be a time. whole totally different, totally different ontology, totally different worldview. I know you didn't ask me about that, but I'm thinking I am much more of a savory type. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I do say, I mean, Same. I don't want to drink blood because I am, of course, almost a vegan, definitely a vegetarian. <laughs> yes. And, yes. you know, also they never say, I mean, vampires, they say blood and the presumption is it's human blood, but it could be other well, kinds. It, and- it has to be human blood. I mean, if we're going to go by the history of the lore, right? Oh. Vampire lore, the history of Gothic vampire lore. Well, it talk has- to me well, about that. Well, okay. You know, if you start with Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is, you know, where our, at least that, that's the origin of our lore. And now we're going into lit mode, which I love because you and I have spent so much time talking about literature, <laughs> you know, just in our regular, in our regular Zoom chats. Um, but, you know, Bram Stoker in the 19th century, late 19th century, wrote Dracula. Okay. And that's where, you know, that novel that novel really kind of inaugurated um, vampire dumb into the realm of Gothic literature, which had already been around for maybe 100, 150 years. Um, you know, I've written about that. Uh, wait, wait, wait. What had been around for 150? The vampire dumb or no, the Gothic, Gothic literature? Gothic. Okay, Gothic got you. literature. Yeah. Go- Gothic literature. Uh, but Bram Stoker wrote, you know, during the during the Victorian era, um, like the late Victorian era, and um, industrial London, uh, and uh, that's pretty much where that's the roots for that's the roots for our vampire fetish, right? <laughs> well, I just I know that we're talking about the Victorian era. We're going to get to the Elizabethan. And what is it about these women rulers that bring out the best in literature? But go back to <laughs> what do you mean by <laughs> What do you mean by gothic? How would you define How would you define gothic literature? What are the emblematic aspects and then why the vampire? Oh, well, you know what? I love that question because I published something in 2010 um, on uh, Shakespeare and the Gothic, um, oh. and so the kind of uh, uh, it, it, the um, the attributes of what's considered to be Gothic, it's usually attributed to have started with Horace Walpole, um, the Castle of Otranto, but I argue it starts earlier, of course, with Hamlet. Oh. And um, oh yeah, Jen. Wait, oh, Jen. how did you do that? We're supposed to be talking I, about Hamlet today and you just I, you just tucked I, it right in there. Yeah, but I but how? that's because that's what I that's what I that's what I published my piece. Shakespeare and the Gothic strain. That's the name of the piece. I, okay, tell I me about forget, that. I always do you forget remember the it? Sorry? So tell me that was from twenty ten. Tell me about it if you remember. Um yeah, I do remember. I'm trying to think of all the things that I listed off as being key oh. to the Gothic, but, 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 um, 
It usually began, and what I did was I kind of set up, uh, 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 what was that HBO thing set in Louisiana? Um, HBO the, Louisiana. Yeah, with the with I the don't... vampires. It, oh, it, Anne Rice, Anne Rice's books. Anne Rice's thing, uh, that thing. Um, it, no, not her novel. The 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 uh, oh, True Blood, True Blood. Okay, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. True Blood, True Blood. Sorry. And you know the the <laughs> so. Like 10 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, this, our culture was totally sunk in the vampire fetish, right? Mm -hmm. Everything was vampire. Now it's zombies. Now it's The Walking Dead. It was those series, that children's, uh, the teen series about the vampires. And I think I, I read one of them and I'm forgetting what it, it's like a metaphor for premarital sex or something. Those vampire, um, teen books what were they called i can't i i can't remember those but i you know i anyway the the the, the way that vampire twilight the twilight series oh, the sorry. Twilight thing. yeah right ten okay, but go, ago, okay ten but go ago. back to your thing sorry okay, well, the hallmark the hallmarks of the gothic uh -huh. are um and you know it it, it crumbling uh, old uh old intergenerational crumbling estates and architecture architecture in deep old aristocratic architecture in deep disrepair okay. and then oh gosh i wish we knew, i wish i'd known i was going to talk about this i would have pulled up i would have i'm just i would have pulled out my essay but this is better because it just forces me to reconnect those neurons um the way that i specifically defined the gothic in my mm -hmm. piece was that something can't be gothic unless it involves a deep, hidden, and shameful family secret. <gasps> and, of course, this corresponds to Edgar Allan Poe's emergence as a writer in America, right? I, I, also, I also said that you know, the way that I would conjure a sense of the Gothic is something buried beneath the floorboards that keeps oh, nice. issuing audible but indecipherable demands. Okay, so whether it's the telltale heart, right. some banging on the floorboards, and, you know, you know this from countless, you know, from the Babadook to, yeah, I mean, countless haunted house stories. Um, so the Gothic is, is, and, and the mad woman in the attic and everything the about this sort of the attic. I mean, Jane yeah. Eric. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, the Gothic is very much about, very much about an attempt to evade a past. Uh -huh. That refuses to be silenced, I and love so this. then yeah. when I wrote about this, I, I I argued that I thought that Ophelia was the first Gothic heroine. So I didn't I didn't subscribe to you know the Walpolean um, genealogy, but you know I'm weird that way. Anyway, so Ophelia Hamlet that yeah. brings me to why. You know, I, I tricked you. I didn't mean to start talking about vampires, no, I, no, but you, I love it. you introduced you know that. <laughs> and it'll always be better if I'm if I'm unprepared. Always. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to keep that in mind. I won't tell my students that, though. Uh, I like when they're prepared. But um, so so th your book. Um, I have a confession to make, which is I when we met, um, I wanted to read your work, and so a couple years ago. Um, I ordered my copy of Hamlet's Heirs. Um, I just went back and checked to see when it was. It was like August of 2020. But I maybe quickly looked at the intro, but the spine wasn't even broken until this week. So I really, <laughs> oh. uh, confession, okay. I tell you, so I, but I, this gave me, you know, knowing that I was going to speak with you, gave me a chance to make the excuse to read it. And I forgot how much I, I love literary criticism, especially the kind of different, um, the different schools of yeah, not yeah, thought, yeah. but different different interpretive met methodologies and the fights over that. But I, but I it didn't. It dawned on me because I knew we were going to be speaking that the title heir might be a pun. Yeah. In other words, you use the word heirs to mean like survivor, someone who inherits a legacy. But I also think the word heir sounds like error, like a mistake. Was that intentional? Oh. Was it Hamlet's errors, oh. or are we his errors, or both? 
<laughs> I love that question. Um, it it wasn't intentional. Uh, my editor, uh, the editor of that book, thought he, he first wanted to call it Hamlet's Hairs, H A I R S. And that's so I funny. Said, well, Michael was saying that's what it was called last night because you know he's always, you know, Michael. I mean, sorry to cut you Michael, off, but of course I know Michael. You know, I know. <laughs> you wanted your editor wanted to do something so silly though. What, what's that about? He, he, Terrence Hawks, uh, famous, famous, brilliant, now late um, editor, but he he called it omelets, hairs. Uh, he just every time we corresponded about it, he would play with it, but. I called it Hamlet's Hamlet's Heirs, H A H E I R S, because Hamlet doesn't have any heirs at the end of the play. He doesn't have any heirs. Oh, right. And so, as you know from from my argument in at least several of the chapters, you know, Hamlet's death is the death of is the death of the state, is the death of it's the end of Denmark. Right, Fortinbras of Norway comes in with his troops, and you know Hamlet has not reproduced. So, w- I wanted to think about um, who are Hamlet's heirs, given that Hamlet dies without having married, without having had children, without having had offspring, and yet he himself, as a figure, as a literary figure, is the most famous heir, not heir. In literary history, right? Firstborn mm-hmm. son, namesake of a king who was murdered, right? Old King mm-hmm. Hamlet murdered. Prince Hamlet doesn't have any siblings. And yet he doesn't inherit the throne. So something's going wrong with succession. I write about that, as you know, because you've, you've, you've now um, read the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Is that up there on your bookshelf? Is I that did. My, is, Oh, See? and uh, I also, you know, you know when the book first came in the mail. I'm like, why is it so cloudy? And then I realized that's a ghost on the cover. <laughs> yes. I didn't know yes. on the black. It, it was a ghost. Well, was that the is that a paperback or a hardcover? It's a paperback. Um, let me wow, and it. it's black. Well, so it's um, it's kind of. I wish you could Ooh, feel it. It kind that. of feels like it feels kind <gasps> of like a velvety thing, but it's a paperback. Okay. And then it's the okay. top half with the title is like is like a gray, and then yeah. there's you know your name, nice. and then below like two yeah. thirds of it is black. But I I feel like Whoa. I see, it might be the ghost of, I don't know who this is. It might be Hamlet Senior. I can't quite tell, or maybe this is a coffee stain. I I, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> Um, but <laughs> uh, the original, the in the original paperback, um, and you know, this is the hard you mean hardcover. Oh, no, the hardcover is no, not even black. I see. Well, no, I the hardcover, the hardcover was for li- you know, university libraries and college libraries. Oh, where they gouge That's, them with the price. Yeah, I get it. The yeah, price exactly. is higher. Yeah, exactly. So you know, the hardcover, and this, this they sent me this when they reissued the hardcover in 2016, um, which surprised me because it meant a, a lot of libraries were reordering it. But the paperback, my paperback, was uh, sort of a pink and purple, uh, with a, with the ghost there. So you know, I don't know. I don't have any any control over what they do around that. But the idea of something going wrong with the process of succession, Mm -hmm. um, and not that there's anything wrong with that in general, but, you know, Shakespeare's writing this, and in Shakespeare's day, succession is... Can we just do this one thing? Let's just just sort of back up, because, I mean, I know we know... What we can do, what we can do, whatever... Back up with the Hamlet. No, so, so, so if we're... Just to kind of back up, I just want to make sure I have this right. Okay. Hamlet was written around 1599-ish? Like, in other words... 1600-ish, yeah. Was okay. right at the turn. So, right, yeah, yeah. So Elizabeth is still alive. James is not yes. the king. Right, And right. What, I, what I learned from taking your class last spring... And I hope I get the name of this. It was Shakespeare and Political Spectacle or something like that. That's it. That's exactly okay. right. Yep. So I'm think I, I start to think a lot more about like when I was rereading Hamlet for this, I was thinking a lot and reading your essays. I was thinking a lot more about 
the context in which this play was performed and what the audience would have been thinking about in terms of their own political milieu, like what was going on with Elizabeth. But also that was fascinated me was that what was going on in Denmark as well in terms of the way they supposedly had elections, but it was really still primogeniture. Okay. Okay. So I guess I want to back. I did read, but I guess I want to back up and because you talk about the trouble with, you know, um, this kind of ties into the Gothic thing, but you you back up with you. you I mean, sorry, you, you you talk just now about problems with succession, and Hamlet doesn't really have the normal expected entitled entitled literally succession. So what what was this play? Two things, I guess, and you, I'm wondering what what the was this one of these plays where people were this was was this a radical play and was elizabeth pissed off was this a challenge to monarchy or was this a celebration of monarchy because hamlet's robbed of monarchy like i'm wondering what this play if you were a queen elizabeth at the time or you were her courtiers would you have been insulted encouraged or how would you have taken this play given that at the end of the day denmark is lost yes, you know what is that is. saying it's not a great thing if you have a monarchy to think it would be you know are they identified identifying with hamlet or Fortinbras comes in and and wins, you know, and again, he had his own legacy it's, issue. Anyway, so I'm just kind of throwing, I'm just throwing stuff out in terms of the political story here. Yeah. And you know what? This is exactly why I so loved having you in that seminar last spring, because this, this is a series of really difficult questions. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, is monarchy a good thing? Is monarchy not a good thing? And you're asking that from the context of the, the issues that we that we talked about in the seminar, which is about how, you know, and I I tried to claim at least, you know, not too heavy handedly, but that Shakespeare himself raised serious issues about, you know, the grounds of sovereignty and and mm-hmm. what it means to you know there are p- serious problems with entitlement so let's just start out by saying that um okay. entitlement is not in and of itself a good thing and furthermore it's often a bad thing and you know thomas paine was the one who drove the 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 nails into the coffin of that in common sense right when 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 the colonies decided to separate uh, to declare independence from the king but your what year was about- that again what year was uh, Thomas Paine? That was, that was uh, Thomas Paine published his first edition of Common Sense in January of 1776. Okay, got it. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to time yeah. frame it. Okay, yeah. go back. Think about that. January 1776. Yeah. The, the Declaration of Independence was published on July 4th, 1776. That day and rings then, a bell. Well, by then, well, yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> Um, but but but, but going back then, to it, but you're saying this is six. This play is written 175 plus years it, before, and you're saying about yes, the problems yes. with entitlement. It, it, yeah, okay, it, absolutely. And in fact, in every Shakespeare political play and history play, this question of who should be in charge and what should the grounds be. Um, you know, the grounds legally are, you know, hereditary succession, patriarchal primogeniture. Um, And, you know, we talked about the Henriad, and we talked about Richard II and Richard and then Queen Elizabeth on the throne and Queen Elizabeth designating her nephew, um, James VI of Scotland, to be James I of England upon her death. Um, The divine, the doctrine of divine right of kings held that, the bloodline. It was the bloodline that conferred legitimacy. Right. Okay. Well, now I would love, gosh, thinking about this now, I'd like to sign off right now and go write something about bloodline legitimacy and vampires. Okay. But that's- <laughs> I was going to say that because I, I didn't want to distract you. <laughs> okay. But you can't keep talking to me. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm now getting into this. I want to hear about okay. what the audience, focus on the audience. <laughs> the audience at the play. You're okay. sitting there watching the, the, the performance the of audience. Hamlet. Okay. The okay. Um, so I'm going to try to put myself into you know kind of the 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 kind of middling level of somebody going to see Hamlet um, in 1600. Um, and uh, 
they don't know anything at all about, <laughs> and there's been so much stuff written about Hamlet, but uh, let me just say this from the outset. Election is not a thing. So it doesn't matter that the word election, you know, that, that the Danish council gave their approval to Claudius being on the throne. Hamlet, the, the audience there, they would have noticed a couple of things. First of all, Claudius married <laughs> the late King Hamlet's widow within apparently weeks of his death. Mm -hmm. So we got something that at least in terms of, you know, scriptural doctrine counts as incest. Uh, the second thing is the speed of that marriage. The third thing is that— Well, just to make the point of, I mean, am I getting this right? Claudius was the king's brother. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, got it. And That's why you say incest. Next, he was not next in line. So if you mm -hmm. think about patriarchal primogeniture, which is a vertical arrow that goes from the legitimate monarch to his firstborn uh, male child. If that male child is dead, it goes to his secondborn male child. If they are both dead, it goes to his firstborn legitimate daughter. Mm -hmm. um, it is a vertical hierarchy. So for that throne to go, to, for Claudius to have taken the throne along with wedding Gertrude, mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of Act One, when Hamlet says, you know, the time is out of joint. Oh, mm -hmm. cursed spite that ever I was born to, to set it right. It, the time is out of joint, but the mm -hmm. question we have to ask is, how is temporality and succession, how are those things, how is the, the movement of progress, of political progress, of national progress and inheritance being marked by the death of kings and proper succession? So, so the audience would have heard this thing about, oh, it's fine, the council approved it, and they would have called BS on that? I believe so. I can't okay. know for sure, Jen. I, but honestly, they would have been they would have been upset by it because it's not how things I are done, so. right? I, okay. I, I think I think so. And you know, having read, <laughs> you know, the eight hundred million pieces of scholarship on the play, uh, Shakespeare's audience wouldn't have known anything at all about Danish about Danish succession, or you know, the Rigsrud, right? The Danish Council of Elders. Uh, but even if they had, the fact of the matter was in Denmark, the, the monarchy went to Oldenburg heirs. So it, it, it automatically went. And the council giving their stamp of approval, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Putin saying, Oh, do you approve? It's like, yeah, we approve. Um, so. So can I just ask you? Audience, okay, go ahead. Shakespeare's audience. No, I just I want to I want to yeah, try as best, that, as best as I can to answer your question because I okay, don't feel good. that I've done oh. it yet. Okay. I think I. Th my guess, my educated guess, is that sh that Shakespeare's audience coming to see Hamlet would have immediately, even before knowing that that Claudius, even before meeting the ghost, but that Claudius. That it, that Claudius was on the throne and was married to uh, his brother's widow, the audience would right away have understood that as something being seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. And that scenario in and of itself for me is Gothic. And, you know, the thing is, I, in Hamlet's Heirs, I wasn't writing about the Gothic, but, you know, and I've written about the Gothic, and now I would look at it differently. And so there's, you know, there's... There's different work in the future, but I believe that Shakespeare's audience would have known there was something wrong with it. Um, I believe that they would have been rooting, and, I'll, and this there, here we can go into generic expectations about what the revenge genre is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I think Shakespeare's audience would have been waiting. Let's say they hadn't seen the play, they would have been wait. They they're there. They would have been waiting for Hamlet to kind of you know shark up a list of his friends, of whom apparently he is many, uh, to take back the throne from Claudius. But that's not what happens. Right. And that's what's so interesting. And on in the, that piece, I'm thinking about the audience, and of course the dramatic tension is wondering, is he, when is he, will he, 
take back the throne. But to me, the political story might be, if you're watching in England, given the history and given the future, that despite um, the fact that the way it's supposed to be through this, you know, vertical, patrilinear, you know, primogeniture um, succession, that it doesn't just happen, that often violence is necessary and undergirds the whole process. And that Hamlet himself isn't willing, he's, it seems like he's seeing himself as a man with normal frailties who doesn't want to take that step. And I have to say, this is the weird thing. I know we're supposed to, when I study Hamlet and just even everything I read about Hamlet, it's always kind of like, well, what a bozo that guy couldn't act so hesitant. And I'm thinking, what the hell? I wouldn't want to go kill somebody. I mean, of course he hesitates. Who wants to commit murder? And so even if it is, so why is, why does he get such a bad rap, Linda? Like, you know, what would you do? Jen, with Jesus. You know, Jen, Jen I mean, th- your question is so crucial. And I think that, I mean, it's, it's why I wrote the, well, it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, right? Everybody is always talking. And I actually did on an Amtrak train. I don't know if you, I can't remember which chapter that was in. I can never remember. It's like most authors have hysterical forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> and I call hysterical forgetting of what's in their chapters. Um, yes, it's it, it's healthier that way, yeah. <laughs> I believe so. I think the ones who can remember exactly where everything is, beware. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, the, the kind of thumbnail sketch in the general, it, it, to the general mind is that Hamlet is famous for being, you know, the 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 prince who equivocates on, you know, payback for his dad, right? Mm -hmm, Uh, right. He equivocates, he procrastinates, he delays. And, you know, Shakespeare was way too canny and um, psychologically smart at that point to be doing anything so simple. And also, you know, Hamlet is the longest play that Shakespeare wrote. So how do you write the longest play of your career about someone who delays? Mm -hmm. And so instead of this being a problem, instead of saying, oh, that Hamlet, you know, he's just a 'er ne'er-do-well or a slacker or, you know, whatever whatever has been said about him. Instead, one needs to look at the process of delay or procrastination itself as being a meaningful, thick, rich, in a sense, gothic text. There's something uh, underneath. Uh, see, thank you for asking. You know, there's something <laughs> underneath the floorboards of gothicness that is pertinent to Hamlet and to that delay. Delay. I, I'm going to take us on a detour, but you mentioned okay. the word procrastination, and I feel like I... <laughs> always liked it and we'll get back we'll get back to yeah. hamlet i promise there's no exit from hamlet jen you don't have to worry <laughs> about that. we'll get back to hamlet we're never going to get away from hamlet <laughs> okay. I, I feel that's so true um but procrastination true. your floorboards yeah. what do you when you're writing um or when you're not writing how do you procrastinate well i think a more interesting question vis-a-vis me would be how do I not procrastinate? <laughs> uh, but what happened with Hamlet's heirs, uh, it, it was begun, I think, in 97, 90, something like that. And, you know, and then Indecision 2000 hit. Um, and, you know, and... Oh, I the Bush writing, Gore. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Bush v. Gore. Um, and a full month. Um, and then, okay, I thought, then I carried on. Uh, because I thought that what I, I was writing was accurate, but then 9-11 happened. Mm. And all of the controversies surrounding um, Bush's election were tabled, you know, for for the nonce, as Shakespeareans would say, was were tabled as the country right. came together and pulled together. And, and uh, all right, so, like, I just, I had to stop working on that project. Um, but... You know, I had a book half finished. And so procrastinating for me 
Um, now I'm much better at procrastinating. I mean, I can, you know, I'll, I'll re, I'll repop orchids. I will do other things. But back then I felt like I had to do something really impressive to justify and really hard to justify procrastination. So I, one day drove out to there's an air there's an airfield an airport in Bloomington 20 minutes from my house and I drove out and took a flying lesson and then I signed up for a second flying lesson and um then I kept coming back and wait a second you wait just let me because I know that you fly but you decided to learn how to fly after the terrorists flew planes into the twin yes. towers Yes. Fascinating, Linda. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. I, no. I actually started slightly before. I took a few okay. flying lessons. But but after that happened, and there there was a there was a four month moratorium, um I, I went back and continued learning to fly, and I'll never forget this as long as I live. I was having a celebratory dinner with a few fellow pilots, um, you know, grown-ups who had been doing their licenses with me. And we were at a restaurant in Bloomington and on the, you know, the big screen TV, which is always in college towns, um, there was the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Oh, I remember. It March, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we, I watched it in utter horror. Um, and, you know, I started to understand what was happening. And anyway, the way, and I had no idea how to finish my book. This goes back to your question, because remember about me, I'll never forget where your question starts. Um, I might get back to you <laughs> two years later, <laughs> but I'll remember. Um, so I just didn't, I was writing about what was wrong with American politics and then 9-11 and then uh, 2003 and shock and awe. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought for sure that we would, I mean, it was so patently obvious to me that the invasion, our invasion of Iraq was bogus, that it was a revenge, an American revenger scenario, right, of W mm -hmm. um, for his, for his father, right, from, from the 93 uh, uh, Gulf War. And, you know, that's Operation Enduring Hamlet. That's, you know, what <laughs> W called the invasion was Operation Enduring Freedom. So, right. um, but I, I, I was sure he wouldn't be reelected. And so I thought, good, I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. But what it would, what it would have meant was scrapping, which I would have been happy, to, more than happy to do, scrapping a couple of chapters because I thought the American public would be, and I hate to say this, and it sounds horrible, but I was shocked that Americans would reelect W. I was shocked by it. And, you know, after a month's worth of depression, I realized that the argument that I was making about America, American revengers, would actually hold up. I didn't have to scrap any chapters. Mm -hmm. And I continued and I finished it. And, you know, this is the really painful thing for me about this book. I wanted to abandon it halfway through because I wanted to have been wrong about American political psychology. But I turned out not to be. But in the couple years interim, while I was waiting to see what would happen, I just felt like... I had to do something with my anxiety and I had to conquer my anxiety in some way. And I was a fearful flyer, fearful on okay. commercial flights, fearful flyer. And I thought, well, okay, you know, you want to deal with a uh, fear? Go learn how to fly. Are you There's still a fearful flyer? No. If you're not flying? Well, I'm fearful, I'm fear no, I'm fearful of fellow passengers. Yeah. Who are crazy. <laughs> when was the last time you flew yourself? Quite a while. You mean my... Me, Either one. Me, Any kind uh, of plane. Well, 
uh, let's see. The last time I was up, well, the last time I was piloting a single engine, and I have a, I have a private pilot's license just for single engine. So mm-hmm. it, it's a private pilot um, license. Uh, the last time I got on a commercial flight was when I went to see my my dad for his 90th uh, birthday. It's yeah. been a while. Well, you know, he died um, in the middle of the big COVID mm-hmm. thing, and so I couldn't get out there. Um, you know, but the thing about flying was that versus, versus, and this may be interesting to the people listening because, you know, some of your audience is going to think, gosh, you know, you had Dahlia on and you had Michael Cohen on and who's this person here? You know, <laughs> who's well, this person? Just, I think by me? now they're like, how can I hear more of this person? <laughs> well, You're incredible, Linda. I mean, not, geez. well, Jen, come on, you know, but we, you, you, you know, we, we are friends and we, we've talked so much in depth about ideas. Um, but you know, the, the, the thing is, going directly into what you're afraid of, mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot to be said for it. And, um, and when it was clear to me in 2004, when, when W was reelected, I knew that I didn't have to jump chapters. And so I immediately went back, revised, wrote two more chapters and finished Hamlet's Heirs. It's a bittersweet. It was a bittersweet thing. Back into the text itself, because um, which text, Hamlet? No, no, your your text. Okay. So you talked about just now, you know, wondering if if the if if the country had taken a different direction, maybe you would have had to scrap things, but it didn't. <laughs> and I, I it, when I was reading it this week, I there are several things I read. That seemed incredibly prescient, the way in which I feel, but also prescient in a way that makes you uncomfortable. The same way that if anyone um, goes back and watches the film Network, um, it, it just, it's just uncanny how much, how quaint it seemed back then. But you, there's one thing in particular, you talk about um, 9-11 um, being, uh, you know, a turning point or an inflection point. I think you might have said. Well, the it, people, it. people said. I talk about that. People said. I wrote that everyone in the media was saying that this changed yes. everything, but that I didn't buy it. Exactly. So this is a sentence, and I felt like this sentence. You know, we have we had nine eleven two thousand one. We also had eleven nine, which was the morning in 2016 when we learned Trump won. We have one six. Right. All these Ooh, moments right. that people say are inflection points, and I think that what you wrote about nine eleven could have been said about the election of Donald Trump. So here is the sentence: the events of September eleventh did not change things so much as they abruptly shoved an already rough beast out of what remained in hiding. I like the Yates reference there too. That just hits in a different way now. Um, do you want to comment on that or does it speak for itself? I, I, I do. It causes me, as you can see on my face, it causes <laughs> me pain because, you know, I mean, you're, you're auto- the, the, the audience can't see it, but it causes me so much pain. I never ever thought it would get so much truer and so much worse. Mm-hmm. Um, what I was talking about was a certain kind of American uh, psychology of American revenger nationalism. That mm. was the genre. And, you know, the, you, the same decade in which that happened was the decade of, you know, Die Hard, Die Hard 2, um, Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 2, Lethal Weapon 3, great grandson of Lethal Weapon. <laughs> that, <laughs> I feel like that's, Just, I feel like you're now starting to make things up, but I start. I was buying that as a title. <laughs> <laughs> I am, but I've also kicked off my flip flops. Okay. Yeah, I'm in Indiana. Oh, you're but in California, California still. I don't believe California. in flip flops. No, 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 I'm not no. in California. I'm in. I'm in Indiana. But, but I don't I'm, like flip flops. Neither Fine. do I. But I'm, I'm trying to. 
I'm trying to do the, you know, this talking with Jen about this on this podcast. <laughs> I get it. I get stays, it. Yeah. Okay. All right. First who stays <laughs> after the party. Um, so, uh, but that decade, you know, the, 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 la- the last American, the, the one with Schwarzenegger, um, which was a Hamlet rip, that the same decade that Bush, uh, that Bush and Cheney, invaded Mm -hmm. Iraq, Mm -hmm. completely misled the American public, totally missed, you know, where the problem actually was. That was the same decade that saw an explosion of refabricated and repackaged Hamlets. And so the point of Hamlet's heirs was about how American politics had been taking this figure uh, had been hamletizing the idea of revenge. So what does that do? In other words, if you're talking about, you know, you mentioned this idea of the, the revenge story and Hamlet, to the, you know, one way to read it is, look, see what happens if you don't act quickly and get revenge. Or maybe another way to read it is revenge is, is fruitless because in the end, Denmark is lost. Hmm. I don't know. Well, how do you see the how do you see Hamlet? What do you mean by Hamletizing the American revenge story? And what is the American revenge story? I mean, there are Boy, many American okay. revenge stories. No, 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 no. Two, two really interesting connected questions, but two, two. Pick one slightly, of them. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'll I'll find a way to hit both. Hopefully. Okay. Um. So, you know what 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 does it mean? What is the American revenge story? And that's, you know, that's a, that's a question with a long arc and longer even than 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 my book. I mean, people in film studies and, you know, the, the, have written about this. Uh, but the idea of the angry, almost on the verge of, of insanity, revenger. Right. That, right? Because everybody says Hamlet's, you know, in the play, it's like, oh, Hamlet's, you know, Hamlet's crazy, although Polonius and Claudius can hear, no, there's a method to this madness. <laughs> you know, the, the, you know the, Hamlet is like the world's first greatest passive aggressive, right? <laughs> He's saying yeah. a bunch of stuff under the cloak of, you know, having put on an antic disposition, pretending to be nuts. Uh, But what he's saying, everything has an edge that anyone who's listening can hear. And in the play, there are people listening, and they, they are getting a funny feeling about him. So what's it about the figure of Hamlet as a revenger, and this I'm coming around to your question, that connects up with how America and how American politics and foreign policy was thinking about revenge in American culture during the aughts. Is it the aughts? Is that what we're calling it? The aughts? I've never been comfortable with that. I will. But... I'll accept it. I'll allow okay. it. Okay. Um, it's always the lone revenger. Right. right, the rogue avenger, uh, the the person who hasn't been given his due avenger, and this is terribly problematic because in the play in Hamlet, and I'll talk about Hamlet just for a few moments, and then we can go in any direction you want. There's no question, and I have argued this. I've argued it down to the mat. Um, that, you know, it, 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 for Shakespeare's audience, for Shakespeare, it's not a question of an election. Um, it's a question of succession. Uh, Hamlet doesn't, you know, why does Hamlet delay for so long? Mm-hmm. And this is, and this is key to what my book does. And I still believe this. I haven't changed my mind about this. And I, I sort of live to change my mind about pieces that I've written in the past. It's right. part of my hysterical forgetting of where things are and where did I see <laughs> what. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> graduate students will ask, oh, where was that published? I'm like, I can't remember. All right. So, uh, so you argue with yourself sometimes about this. Sometimes? Are you kidding? <laughs> you should only live in my head. No. Oh, um, please. It's already so, too crowded in mine. I don't need to get in more fights. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, there's a reason that Hamlet takes so damn long. I mean, the ghost discloses to him Claudius's crime in Act 1, Scene 5. Right? The ghost appears in Act 1, Scene But in Act 1, Scene 5... The ghost says, you know, revenge my foul and unnatural murder, you know, and he says, tis given out. The rumor was, I don't have anything in front of me. I've got nothing in front of me. I moved Are everything away. Are you the one who compared this? Wait, you wrote about Bartleby the Scrivener in this context. <gasps> I'd rather not. Solution. That no, okay, was gonna, so good. Them. Okay. Did you like that? You liked that? I fucking that? loved it. Loved it. Okay. Okay. I... When I made that connection, I'd been did, there was something about Bartleby I'd been wanting to say forever, but didn't know what it was. And when I when I finally got to the end of Hamlet's Heirs, I understood what it was. So the thing about Hamlet, the prince, is that he's stuck. Shakespeare, and I believe Shakespeare did this intentionally. I do because it's his longest play and he sets everything up for succession. He lays everything out in Act 1 for revenge and the genre of revenge tragedy in Shakespeare's day is already, you know, it, it's like when we watch a sitcom or, you know, an episode of Law and Order, we know what to expect. So the revenger tragedy would have been a common genre for Shakespeare's audience. Mm -hmm. So Shakespeare decides instead to write Hamlet. I mean, have I sworn yet? I don't think so. You're what allowed. in the actual fuck? I haven't. This is my one time. <laughs> it's his longest play. The protagonist learns in Act One what, what happened. The ghost of his dead father says, revenge me. And yet Hamlet spends the remaining acts talking about first of all the philosophy of oh okay and you mentioned jen at, at the start of the podcast you know why should hamlet why should hamlet murder right i mean so you know as if it were an ethical uh as if it were an ethical or religious issue for hamlet and you know, the thing is, yeah, in a way it is, of course, because, you know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But that's not what's keeping him from... What's, so from, what's keeping him? Well, I argued at the end of the book that he would prefer not to. <laughs> I was thinking Which about how... brings us to Bartleby. I was that, thinking of the psychology. Oh, sorry, go with it. Oh. No, no, no. The, you were thinking about the psychology of procrastination. Or the and way you talk to children. In other words, when you, we've learned that you don't say to a child, would you like to, or, or you don't say, um, you don't ask a child, you know, would you like to leave now? Or are you done playing? You say, it's time to go. And I don't think the ghost yeah. says it's time to kill it's kind of like it's a more of a question like are you going to do this or not or maybe or was it a command did his father give him a command or he well it's it's interesting the way that it's phrased that's a great question the ghost says oh hamlet if and i don't have it in front of me so a few words will be off i don't have anything in front of me if ever thou didst thy dear father love and hamlet says oh god uh, the ghost says, and revenge his murder. And Hamlet says, murder? And the ghost says, murder most foul, as in the best it is, but this most foul and unnatural. Okay, so something very close to that. Um, if the ghost, if ever anyone had a mandate delivered from beyond the grave... You don't need to look for that passage. <laughs> um, I have it now. <laughs> I'm so used. I'm so used to 
to like Zoom teenying with you and just, you know, <laughs> having conversations. I, I can you see You got it, it exactly right, though. I'm impressed. I, I did? Mean, how many? Wow. Not, okay. Yeah. This, this is like, this is There's a, a strange in there. It's murder most foul, as in the okay. best it is, but the most foul, strange, and unnatural. Oh, okay. I, I forgot strange. Yeah. I mean, basically, if ever I need a bone marrow transplant, they're going to have to find Shakespeare because that's what my bone marrow is. Uh, but I left, <laughs> I left out that word. Um, I think that this issue of, I mean, let's, let's think about what this means. Can we talk about what this means for now? Yes. Because, um, you know, this, y- you, uh, you were gracious enough to put me on <laughs> what's now being called the famous spreadsheet. <laughs> but when you were first, you know, t- talking about a podcast, we, sp- we spoke about these, we spoke about, this and and I'm really grateful to be on the first spreadsheet. I think that for me, the things that I wrote back, you know, a decade ago, and you know, I've continued to publish on Shakespeare and contemporary political psychology because that's how I do it. For me, that's how I do it. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something that will snag me. Oh, and I wanted to tell you about just if we can talk about writing process again for a second. Do we have any yeah. time? We have plenty of time because okay. I've got a couple more things too I really want to ask you about. Okay, okay great. I, for my first book, Notorious Identity, the, you know, one of the things that authors struggle with, as you know. I know you were going to say something, but I want to cut you off because I want to I want to move you somewhere else for a second before you go back to where okay. you were which is what I'm thinking is for most of us who engage or at least as an English major and then maybe others who don't realize this is happening to them as they're being taught Hamlet there are two different branches one is to put situate this play in the western literary tradition Um, You know, beginning with like the Epic of Gilgamesh, moving to the Odyssey with the whole Telemachia piece to that. Um, Then we have Hamlet. Maybe you get some Leopold Bloom um, from Ulysses and maybe even today in Hamilton. But this idea that it's kind of taught, you know, in the Jungian hero's journey, that's one branch. The other branch is this is all Oedipus and like... uh, like we haven't even talked about Hamlet's relationship with his mother and his issues with women, but those it seems like treating this as here is this artifact from the Western literary tradition, and you must know about it just because you won't understand any modern literature if you don't understand Hamlet, the hero's journey. And then we have the other, which is this is all Freud. And yet we have spent our time much more interested in the the political story, which brings me to what I think is the most incredible insight about how over the years the political agenda of Hamlet has been downplayed. You write about this in in your book and that this is the fault of stage as well as film productions who sometimes excise from the play anything about the political agenda. I'm just blown away by this and wonder why that's the case, why we miss that. These are, uh, what you've just asked me, Jen, is, um, is brilliant. And I love when you, um, this is why we're such good friends, because no matter what I say, you say that. And I know having taken a class with you, you do the same with your students. This is what makes you an incredible professor because you make people feel smart. (laughs) No, no, I use the word, I I use the word brilliant um, uh, intermittently. And uh, I never use it when I, when I don't mean it. Um, and the way that you've just, the way that you've just put your question, uh, you know, this, I, I was not expecting this and yet you're exactly right. I mean, I write against the Oedipal, the Oedipal, the way in which the 20th century Oedipalized Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh-huh. Um, and, um, I write against the way in which the, the fact that the entire state of Denmark <laughs> dies, is absorbed into Norway at the end of the play, is ignored in film productions, in, you know, everything is kind of cast aside for this tight little steamy Oedipalized triangle. And um, and I'll return to that. What interests me okay. 
more, okay, because this was a two-part question. I've got one and two. I wrote down <laughs> as you were talking. The first was that Hamlet is situated in the literary tradition of the Bildungsroman, right? The, the, and it, it's, sometimes it's the hero's journey, but often it's... I never thought you know, about it as the uh, coming-of-age novel. I never thought about that. But yeah, 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 good coming, point. Yeah, but the, the coming-of-age novel, the education of the young man, I mean, Stendhal... Son, father, you yeah. Know, oh, interesting. You know, right. Yeah, I didn't, and, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the the buildings Roman, right? The the kind of education of the young man, the coming of age, going out and having experiences in the world. Um in the eighteenth century that becomes really the dominant motif. Prior to that, nobody gives a flying fuck about the educative journey of some nobody. So it's a hero's journey or it's a villain's mm. journey. So when Shakespeare's right, yeah. Um, it, so that's, I mean, let me, let me say that again more clearly. Yeah. The idea of the buildings roman, uh, the, the, the romance, which simply means the kind of narrative over time and involving lots of travel and learning and, you know, separations and reunions. That process for the young man is a process that leads into what we call the romantic literature period. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, yeah, I mean, you know, and and Defoe, and you know, and, and even you know, even for for female characters, but almost always written by men. But you know, Mal Flanders. Yeah. It's a Bill, Bill Bunn's Roman of sorts. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to kind of separate the 18th century literary tradition a bit from what comes before. So how does Hamlet, you know, how do we situate Hamlet in a tradition that includes, you know, Dante's Pilgrim, right, being being guided by by uh, by Virgil down into hell? Right, I mean Dante, uh, Dante's Pilgrim. Um, right, you know how, how do we separate the education of the ordinary person from, you know, some sort of special epiphany for uh, for the chosen ones? And Hamlet, I think, in a way, first of all, I, as you know, having read the book, I completely reject any oedipalized reading of Hamlet. Uh, it's. I just think it's. It's far too easy. It excludes far too much, and um, you know. And and I think that it, it, it. You know, Lawrence Olivier and and I can't remember the whoever directed him. That movie really kind of nailed that in for the 20th century, mm -hmm. and it's wrong. But in Mel Gibson's version, in Zeffirelli's version, that right. was also there. Right in Zeffirelli, that Oedipalized, uh, that Oedipalized and Kenneth narrative. Branagh's version too, right? And, well, in Branagh's version, yeah, except Branagh didn't. He didn't include Fortinbras. Oh, good. Okay, good point. And uh, at, and so what I would say is what. What's wrong with Brano's version, and it's, you know, it's four hours, and the play is performed is about four hours. But what Brano does is, uh, is not so much the liberty that he takes is not by not oedipalizing the relationship between Hamlet and his mother, but giving a backstory of Hamlet and Ophelia as having had sex. That's surprising. It's preposterous. Yeah. And so, you know, we have, we have Brahma's, you know, Shakespeare's Hamlet. And, and I love the way that it ends because, as you know, about the obscene father, and we need to leave a little bit of room to talk about that. The ending of Brahma's movie is the pulling down of the statue of old King Hamlet by the new king, young Fortinbras. Hmm. Pulling that down, which of course echoes the pulling down of Lenin's statue. Uh, Saddam. 
Saddam, I mean, the pulling down of statues. So, so much that Brahma gets right, but he can't resist having a backstory in which Hamlet and Ophelia have had sex. And that's just, you know, I mean, now, I'm not a Shakespeare purist. You know, people can, people can do what they want to do. But if we're talking about the actual play, we're talking about the play. So I, before we wrap things up, I want to think about to the extent that part of your project has always been reading Shakespeare for the present. I'm wondering if we were, if you and I had an opportunity to recast or rewrite Hamlet or think about a current political figure as Hamlet, who would you, who is, who is the Hamlet of our day? I mean, I have a view. You won't be surprised. No, you have an idea. <laughs> okay. No, but, I, but I, that was a question. I mean, my, I just think was, Merrick Garland is our Hamlet. Uh, right I now. was going to say. Love. Was, oh, that's good. That's what popped into my head, Merrick Garland. Oh my, Jen. Yes, of course there's a reason we're friends. <laughs> um, that's... He popped into my head, and what gave me pause, though, why I didn't come right out of the gate, was that um, I'm not, you know, having written so much about this, I I would want to think really hard about it, because Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we are a culture in law that talks so much about intention, Mm -hmm. and so the... the, uh, the fact of designating something as a crime, we get hung up again and again and again. Did this person mean to be committing a crime? Right. And right. so there's fetishizing of intention versus the actual fact of things that were done. And this is where, you know, I mean, for the last five years. My God, years, we I could think, collaborate on this because this is obviously we, huge. We could because I, you know, the last five years I've been working on, you know, critical legal theories. So, um, you know, the the fallacy of hinging, you know, hinging um, an assessment of criminality on intention. This makes me, this really, really aggravates me. I mean, you know, one of the things that that we know at this point and is obvious to everyone, and I'm keeping in mind what you asked about a modern Hamlet. Um, And, you know, you, what came to your mind was Garland and what came to my mind was Garland. But what I'm thinking about is larger, and not just the DOJ, but also... Uh, there's no, there, neither you nor I have any doubt that the only thing that, that has kept the charges from being forthcoming is, uh, a paranoia about how the metric of politicization will be, yes. you know, will be seen. And that's yes. it. So instead, instead of saying, oh, we're worried about being seen as partisan, it comes down again and again to, well, did he know it was criminal? If I shoot somebody and say, I didn't know I was doing anything wrong, does that get me off the hook? Of course not. And so this, what is currently delaying, and I'm going to try to frame this term terms of Hamlet to help us wrap this up. How to, you know, the, the sense of justice, clearly in Hamlet, the play Hamlet, the revenger's ethos is inadequate. Mm-hmm. It's not only inadequate, it's unjust. You know, you find out, okay, he killed, <laughs> oh, the last action hero, that's the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> you killed my father. Okay, you killed my father, I'm going to kill you, and then, of course, the princess bride, right? <laughs> um, my name is... <laughs> God, that's so good. Now I know I have so many movies I want to immediately watch. Okay. (laughs) That's because that's okay. So the Revengers ethos, but you know, the problem is that Talionic law, it's fabulous. Our culture loves it for our fictions. What What is that word? Talionic. 
Yeah, I've never heard it. It's the root. It's the root of retaliation. So, talionic law is Old Testament law, an eye for an eye. Okay, so talionic. Um, and comes, you know, talionic law, it's the root of, uh, the, you know, the word retaliation. Talionic law um, is what makes the concept of revenge so emotionally satisfying um, mm-hmm. that you can inflict a punishment that will be like the crime and will have the same emotional and affective resonance. Well, Our legal system, our entire legal system, is designed to foreclose talionic. Yes. Yes. And so what what do we do when we have a system that won't allow for talionic law? Um, Because the system has all kinds of mitigating factors. Well, the classy way, the way way you're supposed to say it is that, you know, that vengeance isn't a justifiable reason for punishment, but there can be the expressive value. You know, there are these different ways that we try to get at it. And I I find it frustrating because we're supposed to say it's about, um, you know, individualized deterrence, general deterrence, rehabilitation, and all this stuff, but we're not supposed to, we're supposed to frown upon and discourage vengeance as if exactly. it's some sort of primal, unjustifiable um, reaction to harm. Yes. And let me suggest something to you before we, because I, I, I realize that we're, <laughs> we're getting ready to close, but let me suggest something to you, given what you just said, Okay, that our legal system is all about the denial of the talionic <gasps> impulse. That's below the floorboards. But our that's it. We're back to the gothic. Oh my god. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go, go, go. No, don't no, no. This is fabulous. I for cut me. you off though, but you said our whole legal system no, no, is designed no, 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 to, no, no, to, our, to to deny the talionic. Okay. Yes, to deny the talionic impulse, but our entire popular and mass culture <gasps> is about indulging the talionic. Holy shit. So these things are Holy in tension shit. with one another, kind of like Not Catholicism and sex. They're flip sides <laughs> at the same point. <gasps> yes. So the law is about the denial of the talionic impulse, but the cultural imaginary. Right, right, right. So law comes in and says, we're the rational social order. We will replace right. the violence, the anger, the disorder. And yet about, yes. popular we're, we're, culture we're, indulges it because we need it deep in our souls to see it expressed culture. even. And, 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 yeah. and, that, and not only do we need it, in some ways, I or mean, we they, crave it in they some are, sort of way. Yeah. They are in an in, in, integral relationship with each other. Uh, you and I are both against the death penalty. And yes. so, you know, let that, let nobody misunderstand what, what's being said here. However, we're talking about, you know, a book about Hamlet and, you know, uh, the, and, you know, I mean, punishment start- doesn't have to be incarceration. It could be taking everyone's, taking all their wealth away. That's not another thing, which we, right. I mean, There's we're so not many talking about, kinds yes. Of punishment, right. Right. And, and but, but, what the image of law of the law right is about disavowing the talionic impulse hmm. denying it mm-hmm. denying that there could be any pleasure deep dark pleasure this is um, right this is like what i was so writing about the obscene father in dismember me in that chapter that the law is all about no there's no affect we have here but then our mass culture is all about the affect it's all about the feels with a z got it got it and, oh this is so good okay well, is there anything yeah. before we actually f- finally close (laughs) is there anything you know that you i have left out that you feel like no i mean no no except we need another you know 100 hours to talk about this (laughs) 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 i i feel like i need to take another class with you because I don't, I can't get enough. <laughs> right, um, but you're right, but you're, you know, you're, we're, we're right there in sync. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, but I, th- these were my impulses behind writing Hamlet's Errors. Uh, mm-hmm. Was about this disavowal between law and this other 
impulse, which, you know, and, and I'll leave it up to, you know, the auditor to decide which one is contaminating which. And then yeah. we get back to blood. Bloodlines and then, you know, under under supported by blood violence and the vampire impulse. There we go. I the know. gothic, I, you know, that just we should at some point write something yeah. together about okay. uh, about literature and the gothic. So um, thank you. Law, so literature, much. law, literature and the gothic. Let's do it. Law, literature and the gothic. OK. Let's make a let's make a date of that, Linda. It's so great talking okay. with you. You got it. You too. You too, Jen. And thank you so much for having me on with your other illustrious guests this first season, this first run. There are so many more things that Linda and I could have talked about. One thing I didn't get to speak with Linda about was the many moments of prescience in her book, Hamlet's Heirs. Though she wrote it in around 2001 to 2003, it was ultimately published in 2006. And she spoke about the pseudo equivalencies when watching the news, you would hear someone present on the very tragic bombings in London in July 2005, right alongside a news story about how much money a particular movie grossed at the box office or a celebrity who had the flu. And this was written even before we were swamped by social media with all of these pseudo equivalencies. And here's what she wrote, which could be still true today. In a culture in which all kinds of information are presented simultaneously as if they were equally noteworthy. The critical ability to differentiate between what is worthy paying attention to and what is not gradually eroded, and the ability to assess the credibility of certain claims is hobbled. She was seeing that then and, you know, even more so now. Um, There was something else she talked about variety of concepts. And one of them I really liked was this notion of what she called enlightened false consciousness. I had never heard that phrase, enlightened false consciousness, but it certainly fits me and many people I know like a glove. And here's what she said. Unlike the old Marxian notion of false consciousness in which underlings are duped into thinking that those they labor under have their best interests at heart. Enlightened false consciousness involves knowingly choosing to adhere to an ideological fantasy out of a resigned conviction of its inevitable triumph. Uh, I think that's kind of where we are now. Um, So thanks so much for listening. And please remember to follow Booked Up with Jen Taub on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And write to us by email at bookedupatpolitikon.com or send us a letter by mail to Booked Up, P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. See you next week.